Hey Wheaton North, Mr. Yugler here. Let's talk about IMFs and phases. We'll start with the different types of IMFs. I want to take a moment to really emphasize the difference between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. Okay, when I'm, when I'm talking about IMFs, I'm talking about intermolecular forces. So intermolecular would mean between molecules. So I'm talking about right here, from one molecule to another molecule, not from one atom to another atom inside the molecule. And we're going to talk about these as forces, not really bonds, right? This is a covalent bond. Um, the, the attraction between, from one molecule to another molecule is really more of a force. It's not really a chemical bond. We've talked about the, in, the different intramolecular forces, um, intramolecular bonds, I should say, those being ionic, covalent, and metallic. Now we're going to get into the intermolecular forces. Uh, they could be ion dipole or between two polar molecules, dipole dipole. And there's also hydrogen bonding in there, which is a special type of dipole dipole. And then there's also London dispersion forces, which are sometimes referred to as Van der Waals forces. Now let's take a second to talk about ionic. Some people would say and make the case that there are ionic intermolecular forces. And if you think about what that means, what we're saying here would be that uh, this is a molecule of sodium chloride, for example and that the, the attraction force from this molecule to, to another molecule of, of sodium chloride would be an ionic bond or an ionic attraction. If you think about it, ionic salts don't really exist in individual molecules. They exist in crystalline lattice structures, right? So it's really pretty arbitrary to say that this is one molecule of sodium chloride. We could just as easily say that this is one molecule of sodium chloride or that these two are one molecule of sodium chloride. So it's not really completely accurate to even say that we even have molecules of, of uh, ionic salts. Let's start with the strongest, ion dipole. So this is when we're going to have an ion um, attracted to a polar molecule. Polar molecules are referred to as dipoles because they have two poles to them, a, po a partial positive and a partial negative. Just like in, in an ionic um, structure, they're going to weaken with distance. So the closer those, those particles can get to each other, the more strongly they're going to be attracted to each other, right? And so what might affect that is the size of the molecule. If we have a really huge molecule or a really huge particle like iodine, that's going to be attract differently than a really small atom or an ion like hydrogen. They can also vary by strength of charge, right? And that's consistent with Coulomb's law as well. If we think of sodium chloride as an example, aqueous sodium chloride, the anion, if this is a negative 2, then that's obviously going to affect the attraction between this ion and the water molecule. Notice the orientation of, of uh, the water molecules. If we think of water molecule as a polar molecule, where we have the dipole, um, the bond dipoles here, and then we have a net dipole, overall they're going in a downward direction as this is kind of shown, resulting in these partial positives. This is our strongest IMF because the strength of our positive and our negatives are, is the greatest. We have a fully charged um, anion and cation. And then in this case with water, we have a very polar molecule. Uh, and so that partial negative or that partial positive is relatively strong. Before we talk about dipole-dipole, we need to talk briefly about polarity and what makes a, pol a molecule polar. There's two main things that affect it. The electronegativity of the, of the atoms and the geometry of the molecule. Let's talk first about electronegativity. If we look at water compared to hydrogen sulfide, they're essentially the identical. The only difference is the one atom in the center here. Oxygen is very electronegative, it, which again, rem remember that that means that it pulls the electrons in this bond, that these are shared electrons, one pair of them. It's pull they're pulled more towards oxygen than hydrogen. And oxygen, because it's more electronegative, is doing that more than sulfur is able to do it in its bonds. So that results in a greater partial negative on the oxygen than the sulfur ends up getting. So the electronegativity plays a big role in the polarity of the molecule and the polarity of bonds. This will be important when we talk about hydrogen bonding. The most electronegative elements are, are nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So if you have these in your molecule, that's, a, that's especially strongly going to affect the polarity of the bond. The other thing is geometry. So if we compare um, boron trifluoride to ammonia, in boron trifluoride, you have these pretty polar bonds, right? Fluorine versus bromine is a, is a 2.0 difference. So pretty polar bonds, but because they're angled in 120 degrees in opposite directions, they effectively cancel each other out. And this is a trigonal planar molecule. So we don't have a net dipole moment in any one direction. Compare that to ammonia, NH3, where you have actually less polar bonds, um, but because they're angled 
uh, because the trigonal pyramidal shape of the molecule, because they're angled, they're overall going to be directed upwards. And so you have a net dipole moment force going upwards towards that nitrogen. And then on top of it, you have that lone pair as well. This is just another example. In carbon dioxide, with a carbon and two double bond oxygens, you have polar bonds, but they're in opposite directions, and so they effectively cancel each other out. So it's a pretty nonpolar molecule. As, as compared to a ketone, you can have the same carbon double bond oxygen bond, but because of the shape of the molecule, this would be a much more polar molecule than carbon dioxide would be because you have this trigonal planar shape, but uneven pole in, in this upward direction. All right, we're going to first talk about dipole-dipole, and then we'll come back to hydrogen bonding. In dipole-dipole, um, we have an overall dipole moment arrow that's creating a partial charge, partial positives and partial negatives that I just talked about. Here's another example. This is your dipole-dipole force right here, right? This is a polar covalent bond. This is intramolecular. This is our intermolecular force. The chlorine end of this molecule is attracted to the hydrogen end of this molecule because of those partial charges. Now, in order to have a dipole-dipole IMF, you obviously have to have a polar molecule. And the polarity drives the strength of that dipole-dipole force. Replace this chlorine with fluorine, a, a more electronegative element, and now all of a sudden you have an especially strong dipole-dipole force. And that would be hydrogen bonding, which we'll get to in a second. Compare these two molecules at the bottom here. Carbon tetrafluoride with fluoromethane. They have the same uh, tetrahedral shape but their polarities are very different. In the one on the left, you have equal pole in opposite directions, right? Those carbon-fluorine bonds are going to be polar bonds, but the molecule overall has to be nonpolar because it's equal pole in all directions. Fluoromethane, on the other hand, right here, you have that strong pole upwards towards that fluorine and, and less of a pole downwards, um, so it's not fully canceled out. So we do have a polar molecule in this case. And this would result in dipole-dipole. Keep in mind that what I'm talking about with these intermolecular forces is mo the attraction between molecules, right? So you, we're always thinking of this in, a con in the context of multiple molecules of each example. That's why it's helpful here to have two molecules shown. All right, hydrogen bonding is a special case of dipole-dipole where the attraction is especially strong. This is gonna, going to occur when you have a covalent bond between a hydrogen and a fluorine oxygen or nitrogen. Okay, so you can remember this by saying that hydrogen bonding is very fun. It's so fun. The strength of that polarity in that covalent bond is what's driving the, the strength of the IMF, right? These are related to each other. As the strength of that of that positive, partial positive, partial negative increases, the strength of the IMF also increases. These are your hydrogen bonds, right? These are the covalent bonds from the oxygen to the nitrogen, and it's a very polar bond. Oxygen is pulling electrons towards itself. Hydrogen is a very small atom. It almost completely loses its one electron, resulting in a pretty positive partial charge, which then is attracted to the pretty negative partial charge of the oxygen. This is actually what holds DNA together. The linking between guanine and cytosine, for example, is a hydrogen bond. You have oxygens on one, end, on one side and a nitrogen hydrogen covalent bond on the other side. So this is a very polar bond. Nitrogen is pulling electrons towards itself, leaving hydrogen partially positive, which then is attracted to those lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen. Same thing down here. And this is actually what makes DNA work because we have a pretty strong force here between the two ribbons of the DNA but it's not really a chemical bond. It's not a covalent bond. It's not so strong that it can't be broken. And so it holds the DNA together, but it allows the DNA to be relatively easily unzipped, so to speak, in order for it to be replicated. So without these hydrogen bonds, for one thing, water wouldn't have its properties, which would make life impossible. But DNA also wouldn't work. The last one is London dispersion forces. These are sometimes referred to as van der Waals forces. And these are from temporary fluctuations in the electron cloud that create temporary partial charges. Um, because it's temporary, there's no permanent dipole, so we don't we we have to only be talking about nonpolar molecules when London dispersion is the only IMF that's at work. But one thing to keep in mind is that London dispersion forces occur in every molecule. Every molecule has electrons that are flying around in these clouds, and so every molecule exhibits. London dispersion forces. In a, an example like water though, it's so weak compared to the hydrogen bonding that it's essentially ignored a lot of times, but you must remember that London dispersion forces occur in every molecule.
The only other thing to note here is that the molecule size makes a big difference too. So methane versus paraffin, this is largely what candles are made of. Methane is a gas at room temperature. Its molecules are not very strongly attracted to each other. Meanwhile, paraffin is a solid at room temperature. It melts relatively easily, but it, it's a solid at room temperature. The bigger these molecules are, the more electrons can move throughout them and create those temporary dipoles. Sometimes they're called induced dipoles, and I'll show you why here. If we picture two neon atoms, which are obviously nonpolar because it's just one atom, coming towards each other, the electrons are moving freely and they have these temporary attractions and repulsions that can induce a dipole. So we have when they're, when they're together, we have electrons very temporarily on one side of the atom or molecule, uh, creating a very, very slight negative charge. These, pos these partial positives and negatives are incredibly brief and incredibly weak because it's just from the random movement of electrons. But if you have a polar, if you have a, a, a temporary polar arrangement of electrons on one atom, that affects the electrons on the other one. It kind of induces a temporary dipole, and so that's where that, that term induced dipole comes from. Make sure if you have any questions, you have those written down. And there's another video that goes kind of along with this on, on the different phases. All right, this is Mr. Yergler signing out.